Good afternoon, everybody. How's everyone finding the conference? Pardon? <laughs> I know we're getting we're getting you after lunch. We're gonna we're gonna be gentle with you, um, and uh, hopefully gonna have a very interesting conversation with you about the relationship between creativity and these fabulous tech companies that we're building um, all over the world at the moment. Um, my name's Phil Mall. Uh, I'm a partner in Australia's biggest uh, deep tech venture capital firm, which is called Main Sequence. But once upon a time, I was a theatre director. That was my first. Career, and it means that I am uh, this phrase that Tristan came up with, actually called creative first, where I'm also one of these people that lives a creative life but happens to be working deep in technology. Um, but it does uh, tune me into how important it is uh, the, the work of the creative person uh, in the work of building technology companies. And uh, that's what we're going to talk about today with this fantastic panel. Um, so the people joining me today are, uh, we've got Deanne here, Deanne Ritchie, who's VP of Ops at Mod.io. Um, we've got Anthony Zakaria here from uh, Linktree. Um, we've got Kate Armstrong-Couch here, who's the founder of Athelia, and Ward Williams, who's the founder of Seminal. And you'll hear about their companies as we get into the conversation. Um, but what we're going to do just to get the conversation started is just to get into it and weave in the stories of their, their business um, as we go. Um, and so the first topic is really around, you know, what's the point of creativity? If I've got a quantum computing company or a jobs marketplace or any of these sort of classic technology companies, um, what does the creative person do? What is the job? Is it valuable? Are they the people that just make it look pretty when the real work's been done? Or is there something essential um, to the work of a tech company that people from the creative workforce do? Um, so I think I'll seed that question in and see who wants to take, who wants to take that. Everyone's looking at you, Anthony. Sure. Um, hi. I think there's a few things. One, to your point, everything would be pretty boring and bland. Um, and from a tech company point of view, yes, there's the visual aspect in terms of branding and voice and tone. But there's also the um, internal things around from a culture perspective. Um, you know, all the, all the creatives. My co one of my co-founders is a, is a creative, is a, is a designer, and we're very fortunate to have him as part of our business because he could, one, bring everything to life that we were talking about trying to contextualize in, in you know, real form as a product. But also the, um, I used to be an artist manager and there's a, and yes, and it's kind of stereotypical, but there's a certain kind of um, uh, empathy that comes with creatives that people that are maybe more right-brained or business-like, I'm talking in various stereotypes here, but uh, maybe don't have as much of. And um, I found that with all the creatives I've dealt with. And, it's, and it can be, yes, there can be friction between creative and commerce, but I found that, the um, you know the essence that creators always bring to a business from idea generation, bring a different perspective that isn't always just about the numbers is invaluable. I think that's interesting actually when it becomes two way, right? As opposed to you know someone hiring a designer or even worse having an agency. It's not that it's bad having an agency, but it's sort of treating something like it's a secondary activity. So the real work happens in the company. And then someone makes it pretty and sends it back to you and then you're done kind of thing. But I think having, a, having their creative in the company has a conversation then, which actually changes what the thing is, doesn't it? There's a lot more um, curiosity I found with having creatives in the early stage of the business that maybe we didn't have as much of. We definitely did, but there's definitely a lot more of a, a why and really get into the essence of things. Um, yeah. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I'll add to that if if that's working. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, Ophelia is a culture tech company. So we actually all have creative backgrounds, like the founding team. Um, and other than the development team, who actually are also music, have side uh, hustles in the arts, uh, we all come from a creative background. So producers, writers, directors. And um, our chief design officer is, yeah, we, she 
began with us at the... Um, she was there from day one and she designed, um, uh, like, the ACME and did Federation Square and did um, lots of big cultural assets like MCA, the Opera House. And so we actually leverage cultural intelligence and cultural capital and uh, use tech to scale. So we couldn't be exist without creativity. It, it might be hard for you to answer this because it's normal for you, but if you think about your team meetings and, and how you collaborate, like, can you articulate how that might be a bit different to a bunch of software developers sitting around a table? Absolutely. It's, it's the same, same and different. We actually are all online and uh, we use Slack and create huddles. Um, so we have a very, you know, we actually are constantly trying to get tech and culture people to combine. Um, and they're all very neurodiverse in very different ways. Um, and some want to be meeting, you know, in person. Some Like the tech guys don't want to <laughs> talk to anyone. They keep their screens off, you know, from little things to that to much larger things where um, we have very flexible uh, creative time. So we have, you know, key kind of rhythms and moments, but all of our clients are creative. So we have, um, I, yeah, we have kind of what we'd call theatre time or film time. Like we're very used to um, things happening very slowly and then very quickly. So things won't happen with our um, clients for a long time. So we work with producers and films. And then we're used to like going like crazy. Like they'll just do a call and it's like, okay, it's on, let's go, we're filming. And we all drop things and, and go for it. So I think there's this really deadline film production, get the show on kind of uh, ex uh, culture in half of it, and then also looking after the techs who are like, they need routine, they need tickets, they need everything to happen. Um, so yeah, we're constantly trying to combine cultural um, cult cultures and environments with um, with the tech industry, which is interesting. It, it's an interesting sort of point you're making there about the um, you know how you use the time. Is that do you think do you think creative people think differently about improvising around? The world around them, like, I, I, um, like if it's not if it's not a perfect outcome, they can they can find a way that's that's different and imaginative. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. The resilience and the yeah. lateral thinking. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. And that if if someone's had ten years working in certain areas in the arts or in in film or in theatre or writing, um, they're very very uh, valuable and good at, at working in the team. I, I found said, sometimes yeah. the opposite. Oh, really? Well, yeah, just yeah, go perfe ahead. out of perfectionists, oh, yeah. and you get and off and off and to the which is often a, yeah can be a bit of a challenge in a good way because it's, they want to make the thing as good as it possibly can be, but you then get that like what's that what's the saying like perfect is the enemy of done yeah, so it's right. like come on let's right. just you know we can fix it later we can learn from it and you know you're absolutely right yeah I don't think they're mutually exclusive like in in our in our situation we build software for video games. So video games is highly creative, but it is uh, housed in a tech environment. So the people creating the games are engineers. And we have a number of our guys, uh, software engineers, who are building games on the side as well. So they work nine to five with us and then they're doing their passion projects outside of work. So I, I would make the case that um, a lot of, uh, maybe not a lot, but uh, some, some types of engineers are highly creative as well. A uh, little bit of engineer, I guess. Um, I, when I was uh, in my theatre director days, there was a company that I really liked called Breath Goff, who were a Welsh company. And they used to make these site-specific performances in big quarries and things. And they had this one big show that they need. It was all lit with these German cars, these Trabant cars, these communist cars. And they went to Italy and uh, and the, the town where they were performing said, we don't, I'm sorry, but we don't have any cars. So you can't, you, know, you, you basically haven't got your set, but we have got 10,000 tonnes of ice. Will that do? <laughs> and they redesigned the whole performance around that. But I think there's just something to that. Around, I just think about that a lot around startups as well, because, you know, the day isn't perfect. You know, bad things happen. You need to be able to adapt. And having that kind of community in your company can be incredibly valuable. I think that's a really good point. Uh, there isn't a startup in the world that hasn't had to overcome significant obstacles yeah. and you have to be very creative often to get through and past and around those. And sometimes the 
the nature of the business is solving a problem that either uh, is recognised but incredibly difficult to solve, and that's why nobody's done it yet, um, or they've identified, you know, an opportunity um, that maybe others have not seen. And again, both of those are quite creative in their genesis, irrespective of what the actual solution is. Yeah, absolutely. Just Ward. to piggyback on that, um, I mean, starting a business is highly abstract. It's not a linear process. When you're starting a business, you're reorganising the world. And so for us, it's, it's fundamental to have artists and uh, practising artists within our company. So, you know, not only people that have come from Sotheby's and Warner Entertainment, but also photographers that are out there hustling every day trying to, to, trying to eke out a living. Uh, if you're going to change the world, you need people that, you know, believe in themselves and believe that they can change the world. So having creatives within the company is just paramount. And um, I know Airbnb share this thought. They, they really respect having design at the boardroom table. Um, you know, it's not pressed down in, into the lower tiers of, of the company. They actually, you know, want designers uh, making decisions for the business. So for us, it's, it's just incredibly important to, to make sure that we give creators internally a platform um, on how we shape the business. So. Mm. Yeah, we, um, one of our companies in main sequence is called Samsara Eco, which is an enzymatic plastic recycling company. Right, this just sounds so uncreative, right? And if you sort of look at the competition, uh, they are slow, cumbersome companies which manifest. If you sort of take a picture of them, you see pipe, you see something that looks like a, a, a petrol company, a petrol purifying company. But the second hire at Samsara was was a was the creative director, and uh, and she just lives and breathes the creative expression of the mission of Samsara to turn the world's plastic into a you know, fully circular economy, in which she's constantly making things and saying, "What about this? What does that make you think of? How can we use that?" And it just changes the whole dynamic of the company. But look at Airwallex, one of the Australian success stories. You know, that's in banking. You couldn't get a more established, uh, you know, industry if you tried. All highly regulated. You know, you wouldn't think there's room to to move or scratch yourself in that industry that hasn't already been tried and either accepted or rejected from a regulation point of view. And they've come in and uh, you know kind of transformed it uh, in in many ways and have, have provided a level of service that. The other banks, uh, you know, are struggling to to achieve. You know, with Airwallex, I don't know if anybody uses them, but you can get a credit card in like about three seconds. Um, you just create it online, um, and you're up and running. Uh, you can cancel them, change limits. You do all sorts of stuff that, in a banking environment, would be you know four weeks of applications and all kinds of stupidity. Um, so you know, uh, even in the the uh, stodgiest environments, creativity you know is needed and right. and will thrive. Yeah, and it's like, who's used our wallets here? One. Okay, two. yeah, well, a lot of international people here, so. But it's, um, I mean, you're right, it's a, it's a beautiful user experience. And I don't mean beautiful pixels, because a, nice, a designer did a great job. Like, the whole user experience has it's been functional. Tortured. It's not a bank, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, all right, well, let's, let's, let's move the conversation on then into sort of thinking a little bit about what are some of the tools that, creative people need and I'll start with you if I can Kate why don't you just tell us a little bit about Ophelia and exactly what it is and then you know just build a little bit more on what are the what's been the design approach to actually making something for creative people absolutely so um, Ophelia story technologies we're building intelligent story software for the gaming entertainment uh, film television anything that has a narrative underlying and um, so TikTok and in the social media uh, platforms also write their narratives uh, before they they create content as well. So um, what people don't realise is that in a very tech-dominated um, entertainment environment, from gaming to now uh, films are made in game engines and TV is all online, um, with Netflix kind of ruling the Western world, that all the uh, stories are written still on paper. So um, it's a $400 billion industry uh, plus, but the way that all these narratives that are constructed that then you build a, a content world upon are still uh, constructed and written word by word on paper and or post-it notes. It's a very analogue process. So 
we uh, built a technology that we're trying to be better than paper. We incorporate, um, we, we make small language models. Uh, so we use uh, language models and uh, several other intelligent um, technologies to hold and capture all the story elements in models behind the paper. And then can actually, you can actually then uh, manage the story in real time and it can talk directly to the other technologies. So that is, it's really exciting to do that. The hardest thing is actually being better than paper. Um, it's, you know, we've been able to incorporate um, language models and that, but the, the hardest thing is that a creative doesn't want to continually have to change their process to, um, to have to then communicate with people. So the, the amazing advances in technology over the last 30 years are quite difficult for someone who's making a film or, um, or, you know, writing a story because every time they have to communicate with someone, they have to put all the information to an Excel spreadsheet, they still use Excel, but all variations of, or they have to convert to the latest technology and it takes them out of the creative mindset. So, for example, picture a director uh, making a film and you'll see that there are a whole lot of people around them that will translate what they're doing to everyone else and all the technology because having to get out of your creative process is really hard. So our technology um, is, we have been designing technology that tries to not distract the process that one human or a group of humans have. Um, so we've pretty much like tried to replicate the piece of paper and the post-it note um, in our platforms uh, and then do things very cleverly behind uh, so that things will just automatically update for, um, for creatives. So, um, yeah, so we're kind of, I guess we're a technology company that are focusing on the creative experience, which we believe everyone has the creative process. Um, but for professional creatives, uh, we are trying to create very subtle technology that will hold all the elements that they're working on um, so that they can, uh, yeah, they can just focus on the task at hand. So our goal, our dream, uh, which is actually coming soon, is like, have anyone seen the minority report or with the, um, the spatial technologies coming where, you know, someone can just kind of move things around spatially? Um, that's something that creatives love to do in the theatre world. Mm. Like, theatre world is a very analogue creative space and humans love to construct mm. in that. And actually our goal is to create technology where it's just sitting either on your hands or in the space with you. And as you construct the story, the world will build around you. So I love it. You get your whole body into the creative, yeah. into the flow state kind of thing. Yeah, that's right. Emotion uh, capture. I mean, it's yeah. happening already. Yeah, so. yeah. So to just tell me a little bit more about the language models. Like how, they, how are they getting used? Right, so that is a fascinating uh, topic this year because, as you may all know, GPT came out um, and we, we've been working with language models for quite a few years because they're great writers. They're great, as I said, when you're in a creative space and you want to write a story or have a story, it will quickly translate your story and, summar and summarise it, but also pull up texts and, you know, summarise it, pull bits out. So, um, so language models are great. Unfortunately, this year, um, the really, really good ones like GPT and um, Llama and that have indeed copied and skimmed pr pretty much every piece of literature and culture in the world. We've been doing, we have an R&D lab and it's just wild. Like, there's, we've, we've, they've got everything. And it's completely undermines the copyright industry. Like, every, you know, you have to own the work that you're doing. Um, so a part of what we do is we're actually creating small language models or we call it carrier bag um, uh, technologies where you put, you only work with your story or you only work with the data that you own. So you put your, so, so if we were working with Star Wars, say you'd put Star Wars into our small language model and then it would be able to generate um, and do what you want and write very quickly, but just with your data. So that's how yeah. we're kind of playing with it. And, let, and let's just sort of stay on that for a second from each panellist. I think there's an interesting question here. Like in a world where language models are abundant and everywhere, is that good for creative people or bad for creative people? Is it an augmentation or is it a replace, replacement? Ward, you can start that one. Well, I, I, I think it's very good. And I think, you know, we're already seeing the best creators embrace it. So... 
you know, everyone would have seen the, the AI songs that came out three months ago, four months ago, Drake, a new Drake song drops on TikTok and everyone's going wild. And uh, Universal and Sony comes over the top and just slaps it with copyright infringement. Now, that's one way to approach it, but the other way to approach it is to say, like Grimes did with her mm. music, you know what, my voice is free game, right? Anyone out there can go and make a song with my voice, but you pay me 50% of the royalties. Mm. So. I think that for talented creators, for creative minds, it just accelerates the, the, the entire process. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with it, provided that the original creators uh, you know, receive fair royalties and their moral rights, the right to attribution, isn't breached. It's very important that we continue to acknowledge uh, creators that have paved the landscape for us to get here. You know, um, It's been thousands of years of creativity that you know, without attribution and, and royalties, they'll just be forgotten. So I welcome it, but I'm it's sure bit, other people... It's a bit like, um, you know, when you listen... Have you, have you ever been... I'm sure you have ever been stuck in a Spotify playlist auto-generation <laughs> loop and you realise you've just been listening to the same song for six months? <laughs> uh, it's kind of like that, isn't it? Like, unless there's sort of going to be some either sort of new AI or we keep being able to have humans in the loop somewhere... The new spectacularly interesting thing isn't gonna isn't gonna happen. Yeah, I don't think it's a replacement. It's just an advancement of technology, yeah. another another revolution. You know how we do things in the world, and you can either embrace it somehow or get left behind. Yeah. Um, yes, I think I fully agree with you. There needs to be attribution and figure it out, and hopefully the the essence of what possible with AI married with creativity is still there and doesn't get watered down by regulation and all that kind of stuff, which. Mm. You know, like often music is at the forefront of this kind of stuff where, hey, let's create some songs and base off because there's millions and millions of copyrights you can learn from very easily. Um, so if there's a way that can get figured out where artists are still being remunerated correctly, but it enhances creativity and also becomes another toolkit um, for musicians, I think it's a great thing. And it's like, where do you draw the line? That becomes the question to me. Like, at what point is it Grimes? And at what point is it like a half a second sample that's been turned into a beat that, uh, you know, that is something, something much bigger? It can, there is an argument there where it can remove a bit of the art form of playing music yeah. and learning music, potentially. Yeah. I mean, another, uh, just another part of this, and I'm sort of we're getting, skipping ahead to copyright here, but the, yeah, one of my, uh, another thing I did in a prior job was I was, I got sued by all the record companies and movie studios for being uh, the chief technology officer at Kazar, which was one of the file sharing companies. But, you know, one of the, one of the conversations at the time was around, well, I remember Tim O'Reilly from O'Reilly Media said, you know, the biggest problem for artists isn't piracy, it's obscurity. So, like, there's a line somewhere between, uh, you know, let, let the ideas that are sort of manifest in, creativity spread and make someone famous and build up the... And then, go, Kate, uh, you're I, bursting. Let's I'd, go. Ask, I'd argue that there's been a lot of tech companies in the last 10 years that have made a lot of money out yeah. of creatives um, yeah. with that approach. Yeah. And, like, the... It's not controversial to say now that the Spotify's and the yeah. Facebook's and the yeah. Instagram's are... Um, I mean, definitely... the, the uh, Hold on, how do you say this? Um, Snoop Dogg was pretty pissed off a few weeks ago mm. when he was like, oi, I just got a billion, like, plays and that was only a million dollars. Like, what's going on? Like, mm. the entire creative sector yeah. in America is on strike at the moment or at yeah. least the, the story ones because th that's yeah. gone a little bit too far, Yeah, I, I think. agree. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And it's... it's um, did he sell more of his, of his own records as well? I think his reflection was that he sold so much more, like, um, like he he just been there before the streaming had yeah. happened, and yeah. he was like, "Come on, guys! Like, yeah. even Snoop's not happy here." Yeah, so. it's a yeah, it's a fine line because I fully agree, and the, the royalty part of that is not ideal. But there's also the and then and Netflix and Spotify and all these streaming platforms all follow the same kind of power curve. Like, majority mm. of the revenue and audience goes to kind of twenty percent of the top. You know, like when Netflix shows comes out, that, that's consumed by most people on Netflix. And so same as Spotify, look at the top 20% of artists, 80% listen of the audience listen to it. So then therefore the royalties are going that way, which is a challenge. But there is the whole thing of, um, for artists that were around in the CD age, yes, they probably earned more, but the long tail now is much bigger of yeah. folks being able to actually earn a living because of 
this technology. Um, that said, the way, and this is, this is sort of I mean, where regulation or um, incumbents play a part. The, a big part of that is because the record labels are all major shareholders in mm. something like Spotify. And so how royalty deals are cut between the artist and the label and streaming platforms is all kind of behind the scenes stuff that also plays a part, which is not favourable to the artist. At the end of the day, the artist is always the one that gets screwed. And that's happening right now. Like all the studios are negotiating with the tech companies to make sure they have um, all the copyright sorted. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that we're trying to solve at Seminal is uh, much of the copyright world is not on a central register. So, uh, you know, we have trademark registers that's monitored by WIPO out of Switzerland. We have nothing of the kind for the visual arts, for literature, for other forms of copyright. You know, surprisingly, music is, is very protected, and that's because there are only a handful of rights administrators or owners, and you can count them on your hands. You know, major international entertainment labels like Sony, like Universal, Warner Chapel, but in the visual arts, in writing and literature, and in other forms of copyright, let's say even, you know, podcasters, for example, there's no central registry, and nobody has any clue who owns what. And it's a huge problem because... Now we're in a digital world, the access to content through millions of channels makes it impossible to reconcile back to who actually owns the damn thing that we're consuming. So what we're trying to do at Seminal is essentially create a global copyright database for visual artists so that we can protect, we can identify who the owner is, and then create a licensing infrastructure to make sure every time an artwork is used digitally, every time a podcaster's file is played on any channel in the world, there's a royalty split and an attribution. So, you know, it's, it's an incredibly challenging time and we're behind the eight ball now because the LLMs have scraped everything. They've gone through every website in the world. They've got all of the data. And I think, you know, when we look at the state of the world and you were talking about mm. where's the line, uh, coming back to Grimes, you can't walk back creativity. Once mm. it is out there in the world, there is a work. Mm. And the real question is, are we going to protect it or not? It's not, you know, can we undo this? You know, that Drake song that was taken down off TikTok, it exists, it's out there in the ether. And so do we embrace it or do we try to fight it? Yeah. I think that's the real question. Yeah, and that was, that was certainly, in the Kazar days, it was fight it, right? And it was, you know, we were, we were doing a lot of this digital rights management, you might, have, might remember from the time. But it meant nothing could spread. Everything was locked on the user's computer. Uh, and... Um, and there was something they're missing from the sort of transmission of ideas and art. So it's like there needs to be like a balance between the two. So, I mean, let's, let's sort of stay on Seminole for a bit and imagine these situations. So, like, what would happen if, uh, you, know, I paint, you know, I do a painting or a piece of digital art, I put it on my website, put it up for sale, it gets scraped by Google, somebody finds it because they're searching for a cool image for their blog post, you know, they, they put it up. Like, how, just talk to us about how, you know, how, what, what's, the, what's the motion of finding it and, and yeah. <laughs> well, there's many ways to identify infringement, um, which we're already doing. Um, but, you know, either someone is going to alert us about it or our technology will find it on your behalf in the background. Uh, once we do find it, the real question is, is there a retroactive licence or are we going after damages? In other words, have you damaged my brand such that I can't earn an income into the future? Yeah. Or do I already sell this product and you should have just purchased a license from me in the first place? Mm -hmm. So what Seminole does is when we find copyright infringement, we automate legal action, whether that's a letter of demand, uh, an issue of a retroactive license and ongoing. Um, so it, 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 it all, there's a lot of nuance, it all mm. depends on the, on the situation. Um, and then should you not comply with our demands, um, that's where we you know, escalate legal action yeah. and we'll connect you with local attorneys to take it from there. Is it like a, uh, the equivalent of what Google does with videos and things but for visual art? It, it, yeah, very similar. Yeah. And um, you, know, you, you spoke about Google. Um, as I said, the, the music industry doesn't really you know, know of this problem anymore. We, we're well past the MP3 days mm. in the music industry. Uh, Google ended up buying Content ID for a billion dollars. That is essentially the pseudo register for music. But mm. outside of music, there, there's there's no police, you know, enforcing copyright infringement in art, in literature, in podcasting. So, yeah, um, yeah it's it's uh, it's very important because if you're not able to first create a register, you can't identify who owns the work, and then you can't issue a license in the first place. 
And you know, ultimately, what Seminole is trying to help uh, visual artists do is sell their copyright. So, you know, we see today musicians, Springsteen, Bowie, selling their back catalogues for hundreds of millions. What do you think Warhol sold his back catalogue for? Frida Kahlo. Well, the answer is they all died. They all died owning it. Right. And they never saw a cent from yeah. their copyright. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's fundamentally important in a world that is going digital where reproduction is infinite. So it's a, it's a terribly pressing issue. And, of course, uh, you know, everyone in some ways, is a creative these days. And I think sort of coming on to your business, Dion, I mean, you're, you're helping these, this sort of the long tail of creatives and the mods they're making for games to, yeah. to distribute what they're doing. Tell, tell us about that and how you're, how you're working with those people. So we make software for video games to integrate into their game, which enables uh, their community uh, around that game to build content mods, if you're familiar with that, or user-generated content. Uh, for those games. So mods have been around for as long as there's been video games. Uh, back in the day, you used to have to hack into the game and uh, you'd be quite technically literate to be able to create mods. These days, um, it's moving far more towards a, an official um, platform or capability. A lot of games will provide tools that make it easy for people to create mods. The flip side of that, though, is that they often put constraints on it in terms of what kinds of things that you can, can mod or, or create for the game. So, you know, there's, there's good sides and bad sides to it. Uh, but back in the day, similar to, to what you guys were talking about, it was a bit of a war uh, where, um, you know, somebody would create something, it would come to the attention of, of the owners of that game, they would, you know, send cease and desist letters and, and take them to court and all kinds of nastiness would happen. Um, I think now that the industry has shifted towards understanding that UGC is actually incredibly beneficial for everybody. It's one of those rare situations. It's a bit of a win-win-win because uh, the, the creatives uh, or uh, mod creators, you know, get to do what they love uh, for the games that they're really passionate about. Uh, the game players get a whole lot of extra content that is often very unique uh, because the creatives are not constrained by the group thing happening within uh, the game developer. Um, they create all kinds of amazing things that would never see the light of day um, or get the blessing of, of the game developer. Um, and then the game developer obviously benefits in terms of, of players uh, being more engaged in the game, playing for longer, you know, buying new versions of it, et cetera, et cetera, like builds a much stronger community around the game. So everybody wins um, by having these official mod communities around the games. Um, there are still challenges with, with IP, of course, because, uh, you know, not all mods are created from scratch. They might start using somebody else's content and riff off that um, in much the same way that people in music are sampling and the equivalent. So all the same kinds of challenges and issues in, in video gaming as well in terms of who owns that, that actual creative piece. It's, um, it's kind of similar to the Grimes story in music, isn't it? Because where Grimes said, hey, there's this sort of tech innovation happening which might cause me to lose control she's just straight away jumped in and said well here's all the assets you need just to jump on that and here's how you pay me for it and then you're doing a similar thing with mod io you're kind of saying here's something that consumers sort of started doing from a you know with a pirate mindset just to kind of you know not to not to steal the work i mean to sort of just make what they want to make in a you know a, a great new world and just saying well let's let's make that part of the the business going forward yeah. Yes, we're bringing it out of the dark into the light. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. And then, how, how, like, you know, on the copyright front, like, how does that work on the, like, when when somebody, because, you know, let's, you know, you might disagree with me here, but I think all art is copying, right? You know, you, start, you, you take an idea, you riff with it yourself, you kind of need something new happens. You know, if you're making a mod, you... Yeah, you, you go, wow, that guy's pyramid was fantastic. I want to make a version of that, but with, you know, snow on top and it's all slippery and all this. Like, so how, where does, is there a line there that's emerging in, in your world? About well, there's, there's nothing original in the world. Anybody yeah. who's been to, you know, any of the ancient sites in Rome and whatnot knows that they had half the tech that we have today just in a slightly different form. So yeah. there's no original, genuinely original things out there, I don't think. Yeah. Um, we are in the perhaps fortunate position of uh, being the facilitator and enabler. Uh, so our platform uh, provides the tools, you know, to, to handle DMCA takedown requests and, and all that kind of stuff, but we are not the decision makers. Mm. 
So uh, we get to sit on the fence on this one. <laughs> right. Uh, what do you think about that, Kate? Oh, well, uh, <laughs> the, um, just today we, we follow the copyright um, situation with lang language models and, you know, how, you know, mm. how is Grimes going to be yeah. getting her money from yeah. everyone who remixes? Smart contracts. Smart contracts, thank you. Excellent. Uh, the, the, an artist, it came out today that an artist is suing... Uh, large language models, uh, not not just because they have skimmed their own data, but the language model by concept is in breach of copyright. And I think that, you know, mm. we all thought, well, hold on a minute, like everything is a oh, reference of everything else. The model like, itself, like it was a human the that's copying. of large language models <laughs> Interesting. is yeah. a breach of copyright. And, <laughs> and we all just set... set down today, we were all talking, going, "Well, hold on a minute. Isn't culture like right, re right. doesn't culture reference every piece of literature? Hasn't every writer yeah, reference yeah. it?" And we're just like, "Oh my god! If that was to be imagine if that was precedent, court, if that it, became precedent, yeah. like culture would die." So yeah, that's right. You know, so culture's it's illegal now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's it, it's an interesting time. I think it's kind of full circle coming back to you know your first point. Um, why is art and why is creativity important? And, you know, the world, you walk around the concrete jungle of the city, every car is black, white and grey. It's boring. Mm. It's dull. And, you know, creators allow us to, you know, think like an abstract for one second and, and peek into the future. I think it's, uh, you know, so important that we do protect uh, creators, whether they are leveraging LLMs or not. Um, just to, you know, dive into what our tech does in a little bit more detail because we're not actually arbitrating on copyright. Where we identify that you have sampled someone else's work, we're not making a decision on it. We bring people together to make that royalty decision. Mm. So exactly what Grimes has done, but instead of just saying blanket 50%, I'm happy with that, maybe you've used 90% and sampled mm. that from someone's work. Um, we want to avoid situations where people end up either in court, fighting and disputing, or settling before court. So um, I think, you know, that will ultimately find its way into all of our industries. I know, um, you know, Anthony, you're largely in the music world, gaming, writing. I think, you know, it's an, an inevitable sort of future where nothing is new. The only question is who owns, you know, these sampled works. It's um, touching on this before, but you were kind of all riffing on it. The whole, and um, everyone is a creator in a way, and technology, particularly social tech, has allowed us and allowed everybody to express that in whatever form. And the whole thing of TikTok and YouTube is all about remixing content. There's a, and the whole digital rights management thing is a bunch of platforms that do that for content creators on YouTube because their content would get riffed off and, and stolen and used elsewhere. But in TikTok, it's kind of free reign, but it kind of helps something go viral and people are kind of okay with it there and helps music do the same thing. Um, how we control it, I don't know, but I think it's a it's... Uh, I think it's actually an amazing thing, and TikTok and YouTube position themselves as entertainment companies, not you know, not social media companies necessarily. Um, and so, I, I mean, there's a, yes, there's a there's a bit of a fine line there. But I, how do you approach that when it comes to the, well, that form of content? I've, I've got a sort of I want to challenge you on a couple of things. You know, with LLMs for writers and musicians, and even you know, software developers for games, there is so much noise. And every middle-aged man has a podcast these days. And, you know, wh which... And middle-aged woman. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have one yet. <laughs> and women. How, how do you cut through? Um, and I, I wanted to know, you know, are you hearing from creators on your end that they're really struggling to find a voice in, you know, this AI generative world? I wanted to ask Anthony that, because you talked about that you're seeing a long tail actually working economically and I remember Eric Schmidt like 10 years ago you know coming out when he was running I think YouTube going you know the long tail it's all about the long tail at YouTube and then he came out and he said oh actually I'm sorry I got it wrong it's all about Beyonce like it's just you know but like yeah. but actually you're saying it's it's happened like yeah it depends how you want to frame it in terms of like making some money or earning a, a bit of a living or a good living um there's definitely, you know, the whole notion of the creator middle class where um, folks can create, build an audience across social and monetize that via ads, selling products, partnerships, whatever it might be, and actually make good money on that. And they may not be superstar celebrities, um, but we're seeing 
a lot of this happen where creators then turn, build a brand, build an audience, and then sell products off the back of that. And that becomes it. And they start multiple businesses around that. The Kardashian uh, we, yeah, kind of Yeah, exactly. Effect. But you know, on a smaller scale, it could be selling courses. It could be selling, you know, hydration drinks, like whatever it is. <laughs> but um, so there definitely is it. But there's the, the power law is still there no matter what, where it's about Beyonce or Taylor Swift or whatever. Um, but that said, yes, it is hard to cut through. But you're still seeing creators cut through every day. They, they pop off eventually. If there's like a bit of a this whole thing, like the whole um, create a hierarchy of needs, and it's often about niches and then focusing on that niche and being very consistent about it. Um, it's a whole other thing we can get into. Yeah. In, in terms of you know equity in platforms and distribution, um, you know obviously there's a handful of streaming competitors now, but of course Linktree probably has a handful of competitors. Um, do you see it as, you know, you see Spotify and that, you know, you're really enhancing the experience for, like, the vast majority of users as opposed to top 1%? Yeah, the whole, the whole thing of Linktree from the beginning has been about being platform agnostic. And so we built Linktree as a way to, mainly for musicians at the start, because um, as artists, you're, you don't own your funnel, you don't own your journey, your, your customer journey, your artist, your audience is consuming music upon have many platforms, they're buying merch somewhere else, they're buying tickets across any number of ticketing platforms. And so as an artist, um, and often you have different stakeholders that manage that for you, be it a record label or a promoter. And so to consolidate it into one spot and direct your audience to the places you want them to go where you're trying to monetize or engage was really complicated. And so Linktree was that solution at the time to put all the links to the most important things you care about right now into one spot and share that across your socials. It turns out that was the whole fragmentation of music is actually the fragmentation of like the internet at large. So yes, creators and influencers are a big audience. Um, but you know, we have a huge real, real estate audience, heaps of realtors mm -hmm. use it to consolidate everything they do. A lot of professionals use it. So yes, they might put their LinkedIn and Twitter, but they might use it as a, as a place to curate all the things that are interesting to them. And they share that as their business card. And so it's just an interesting point around like, you know, everyone is a creator. It's like, well, I don't create content. I'm not a YouTuber, but you're more of maybe you're a curator because you're, there's a podcast you're into. There's something you're maybe you're into cycling and you're creating mm. content about that. Um, so, yes, yeah, so to the point about competitors, yeah, there's a few around, but I think that we have always been platform agnostic and try to um, help our audience, our users grow their audience no matter where they are, be it across socials, on Spotify, on YouTube, on podcasting platforms, um, or even there's a lot of, what's actually really interesting, a lot of small businesses use us instead of a website, particularly like restaurants, food and mm -hmm. beverage, you know, use it just latest menu, bookings, so maybe some YouTube content if they're, you know, that way inclined. Um, yeah. It's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because it's another example of, you know, an industry, if you like, which, which uh, uh, you know, the creative industry, the, the music industry specifically, which you know so well and understand from your prior career, needed to solve a lot of these problems first because it was sort of di it was digital it was one of the first things to sort of go digital and then it was the, one of the first things to start to be remixed and fragmented and shared so we had to find solutions for all this and then sort of link tree rose out of that didn't it but then the rest of us find ourselves in the same situation and we need it too yeah yeah, yeah. it's pretty yeah there's uh there's a whole bunch of use cases we never thought would would happen to, it is mostly in the creative sector but yeah a lot of random random use cases that um like the, the thing that gets us all the time is when we see like you know a pizza shop down the road using it I'm like yeah oh, fuck, that's cool that's cool yeah but you do still get a, a nice feeling when you sort of see a little link also tree when it's URL. that kind of a business yeah. you know that you know that's like your coffee shop or whatever which yeah. yeah fantastic well we've got we've only got six minutes left were there any questions for the panel from the crowd oh, here we go oh gosh here we go we're gonna have to be quick let's go uh, i'm gonna need to hand out He's a mic runner. Thanks so much. So, yeah. Thank you. I'm Klaus from Denmark. Uh, we have a lot of creative in industries there. Um, now technology is also becoming creative, as we had talked about with the last elements. And in 10 years, then, we'll be a thousand times more creative than now. Um, so IP... That wouldn't matter probably in 10 years because we just create it in real time. So my question is, what will that do to the business models of creative tech? Go on, I, Kate. I'm not sure if 
see, I think there's, a, there's creativity, there's tech that enhances creativity, and then there's the creative industries, which uh, keep, like, a lot of Australians, like, uh, employed. Like, it's, a, it's one of the major industries, I think, of most of the, um, the Western world or democratic um, uh, countries. And that, uh, well, there was, there's a film called The Devil Wears Prada. I don't know if anyone's seen that. And there's a, there's a scene in that where Anna Winter, the Anna Winter character, who... Anna Winter is one of the most creatively powerful industry people in the world. And she, she says something to your comment where you said, look, there's black and white cars and there's not much going on, you know, and you need creativity. And her speech was about saying, see that that old black nothing designed thing in the corner that was actually designed by someone at some point and it was a part of a collection. She was actually talking about a scarf and she talked about how the colour was decided by creatives um, I th and that it was then ended up in Kmart and it, and it funded jobs and it was created um, economies. So I think IP is important because of the economies of scale and it supports our creative industry. I think also there is going to be a renaissance and an explosion in the metaverse, in the internet, in the creation of using language models as well. And I think that what's really interesting is who controls that, who are the middlemen. We have a middleman here, a new middleman. <laughs> like the middlemen in that industry is really important. That's what the studios do, um, that... Uh, running creative industries I don't think will go away because it's too lucrative. I hope some extraordinary creativity happens outside of the IP realm and I hope that it, it's not controlled too much. And I live that every day. That's what we see, like this bustle and power play between who owns and who stops creativity and represses it versus who enhances it and... and and creates new environments. And what'll be interesting is, you know, is the thousand X multiple, which I like to how you frame that up, is that is that a thousand X uh, on the world that we visualize and listen to as, as Spotify today, which so today's media, if you know what I mean, rather, or is it like Grimes like media or totally other, th other things that we haven't even thought of yet that need, you know, millions of creators to get involved with, we don't know, but I certainly, for, for my part, I hope it's the latter. Uh, let's go down here. Yeah. Peter Kasprak from Innovate Australia. I got a question. Uh, you talked a little bit about the studios. Okay, right now there is a strike in Hollywood. Uh, are we seeing end of the era? Uh, you know, because with creative, I can see I'm interested in AI. I can see that in the future, basically you talk and the screen will render whatever you're talking mm. about, you know? So you don't need the camera crew and all they're gonna be far better than actually, uh, you know, just, just uh, individual people actually filming it. So are we seeing end of the era? And if so, so what's gonna be after that? And can one of you sort of speak to what that dispute is around AI? Because I think that's really important. Does anyone, anyone know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 So the the two points in the strike um, are the wages. So it's a tech company has has moved in on. Uh, all the tech companies have moved in on Hollywood, and Netflix business model. It's um, price fixed. Uh, all the writers and it's underpaying. Uh, a lot of people. However, at the same time, there's probably twice as many people now working and more content. So there's that point. And then the other is that AI without regulation, if you can say that a piece of AI wrote something, then producers and studios don't need to employ people. So there's that kind of jostle of credit. And I think you're right. I think that we are at a turning point and a new era. And I think it's going to be very interesting and that's why an entire industry is shut down and at the same time Hollywood is the oldest startup in the world it's over a hundred years old its piece of technology is a piece of paper with a script it's been here and no one has innovated on it you know hopefully we can contribute uh, I think that you know don't mess with creatives like like the creative industry are really good at holding uh, their own. And Hollywood producers have, in fact, Edison, like 100 years ago, Edison tried to patent and create um, the, the camera and the film format. And this group of Hollywood uh, producers created Hollywood and said, no, that's not going to happen. So they have a history of always coming in as middlemen. The middlemen die, but they always come back. 
and they always come and they take the most creative things and then they control it. So I, th I hope, again, to the other point, it's, it's going to be a great time. Yep. But Let me challenge you with something, yeah, yeah. Though, right? Because, you know, part of it was, of course, that the studios were claiming the rights of someone's image to use subsequently having captured oh, yes, it in that, right? Well. Yeah. Now, an extension of your product yeah. is actually you just have Robert De Niro in it yeah. and you just write directly to Robert De Niro and you just render it to the screen. Okay. Are you, you going to stop? Are you not going to do that? Uh, no, that has been done already, but yeah. it's just waiting for copyright. Yeah. Yeah, but, what, yeah, but that's the, you know, that, that there's going to be another line there because the, your, the way to have maximum flow is you just, that you go straight from imagining an actor doing it to the, the actor doing it. It's it, like theatre. Yeah. The <laughs> it doesn't mean yeah. it's good though, and that's yeah. the bit, right. and yeah. that you want to watch it. Yeah, so. yeah. yeah. I agree. Uh, I'm over time, but let's go, let's go over here. Thank you. Uh, Ari Zaman from the um, Commonwealth Businessmen's Network. Our chair, Frida Mertius, is a Melbourneian. She's here as well. I want to ask a question about fashion, fashion technology. I think in a few days' time, the British government with the Commonwealth Fashion Council will be producing the first major report on Commonwealth fashion. So my, com my question to you is around this interface of fashion's, fa the fashion industry's adoption of AI, NFTs, and fashion collectibles and all of that. So what, what potential is there for Australia to play into that space? In what sense? I don't think I... Fashion, I, I, I don't quite understand the question. So what I'm asking about fashion industry and create tech. Yeah. yeah? So what, what potential... I gave you some examples of NFTs and fashion collectibles. What opportunity is there for Australia to, and, and other, others that you work with to play into that space, to benefit, to capture, the, capture those opportunities? Great. Any responses? Fashion, no, don't worry, fashionweek.ai. Uh, yeah, just sorry, but yeah, you're hearing, but you're going to see that actually was done by AI, and the whole thing actually was done, including models and the, and the designs. So. Is that here, yeah. Australia? Yeah. No. Um, I mean, I, Do you I see think much it's fashion be, yeah. come through. Are you talking from a design perspective or retail? Yeah. 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 We're going to be. Yeah. Um, we see a lot from a retail perspective. Um, a lot of commerce transactions to Shopify merchants or Amazon in particular um, and a lot of affiliate style. So a lot of the commerce side, but does the design side, no, not so much. Mm. Um, I think there's a huge potential obviously in the AI side, but, you know, where are you kind of learning from? The, you know, Shopify obviously sit on huge data, so to Amazon, and so there's a lot of potential there for recommendations and increasing, you know, rec uh, sales transactions through that. From it's a, a design side, it's probably similar challenges to other creatives, I guess. But it's an industry I'm not too familiar with. It'll be... Um, we're doing quite a lot of fashion in our portfolio, and um, it's, a, it's, a, it's an industry which is poised for sort of massive changes because it's not just what the designs are, it's what the materials are and how they're made and how they're circular. Um, I think one of the big synthetic biology companies just sort of has just started promoting this whole idea of you know, uh, materials that are created by nature, you know, rather than all the synthetic materials that we use. So just as I started sort of thinking about your question, you think, when I think about how I use Mid Journey, for example, has anyone in, this, in, the, in the room used Mid Journey? Can I just see a show of hands? It's a super creative product, right, where you can, you can, you can, you can riff, if you like, with, a, with, with visual ideas. Like imagine doing that with your clothes and then somehow being able to produce them and then they're being produced in a fully circular place. Because I think the reason the circular piece is interesting, I think, is it because people are going to have to rebuild the mills and the fabric production. So it means you can start plugging in some of these design aspects when these, when these new things are built. So it's going to get interesting. But I think we could talk all afternoon, but we are over time uh, uh, and people will get grumpy with me. So I think we need to wrap it up. Could everyone please give a big round of applause to the panel? Yeah.